Good morning. Unfortunately, uh, Lauren Coffey uh, has the COVID, and uh, as most of you probably know, Lauren lives with Mike and Tracy, and so just out of a uh, precaution, uh, Mike and Tracy both feel totally fine, but just as a precaution, uh, I might have said nicely, stay home, and wagged my bony finger uh, over the phone, but uh, that's what's going on. Um, so Mike is uh, Mike and Tracy are know, scrambling is the right word, trying, efforting uh, to uh, get a test here uh, sooner rather than later for themselves. But uh, they say they feel completely fine, and Lauren actually has uh, more on the more on the mild, minor uh, symptoms, and so hopefully uh, everything uh, works out there. Um, that's actually a medieval church expression. Uh, knock on wood. It's to identify with the cross of Christ as you knock on wood three times. So it's not as superstitious as, uh, as, you, might, uh, as you might think. Um, and so what that does that, of course, uh, of course we have, uh, there's, a, there's a domino effect of that. And so that calls into question some plans we had for the, uh, for the rest of this week. So the office was already going to only be open until noon because it's the, the week of Christmas and we have some uh, good reasons for that. Uh, it's still open, but would you not come by? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it's it's open, but please uh, please use uh, extreme caution. And I'm not sure how Mike will handle this or whatever, but just it makes sense that if we all stay apart uh, after after today as much as possible. And then uh, we did have a, a Christmas Eve service, and I think it's too soon, uh, too many balls in the air. There's a few things that I'm not mentioning because it's not my place to comment on other people's health. Um, anyway. Uh, so there's a, there's a few more factors in the air. So here is what uh, we'll call you. Here's what we're going to do. We are going to uh, email you all the Christmas Eve plans uh, by, uh, by Tuesday afternoon. Uh, if you're not on that email list, call the office on uh, Wednesday morning, please, to find out. And so then we'll, uh, we'll have some time to uh, figure out what's going on uh, with Christmas Eve. I know I'm giving way too much detail here, but to make a really long story short, I was just able to get a COVID test the other day. I, I have no symptoms whatsoever. I went ahead and just took one for the for the fun of it, just because who doesn't want to get a shot in their nose? Uh, I went ahead, and I don't have the results of that, but just say, you know, God forbid, uh, maybe we're not able to have a Christmas Eve service. I just, I, I don't know. So, um that's why I'm trying to cast some doubt on it now, just so that you're not caught off guard if that is what ends up happening. But I'm, not, I'm also not announcing that there's been a cancellation. I'm announcing that I don't know what's going to happen in a few days, which is always the case, but it seems more, seems more the case right now. If anybody got that, please raise your hand and everyone come talk to that person. Okay, <laughs> talk to the people with whose hands are up, and, uh, and that's it. Okay. If you're able, uh, please stand and let's hear God's call to worship him. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Amen. Please remain standing while we uh, light the fourth Advent count, candle. This is from Micah 5, 2. But you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for, for me, one who is to be ruler of Israel. Amen. Sing our first hymn. And since you're standing already, why don't we sing our first hymn? <laughs> it is, O come, all ye faithful.
my wife told me we were going to do that tag at the end, and I misled you because I forgot. <laughs> you may be seated. Turning now again in your order of worship, let us together as God's people confess our sin. Our Father, you are holy, holy, holy. We, however, are not. We are born in sin. Though you are our maker, owner, and sustainer, we believe and behave as if we are our own. Forgive us for the things we have done and for the good we have left undone. Renew a right spirit within us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. People of God, now hear the good news of the gospel. As far as east is from west, that far, God has removed your transgressions from you. Rejoice then. Be at peace. Every single one of your sins is forgiven you on account of Christ. Amen. Carmen uh, requests prayer for uh, Cookie, 
who was having a heart stent uh, surgery on Wednesday. Been praying for Cookie for uh, feels like a, a month now, and so that the time has come for that. So uh, please be in prayer for Cookie Anthony. Roger Osgood, uh, we mentioned a few week, a couple weeks ago, his mother passed away, but that uh, has required some uh, travel to Arizona. Continue to be in prayer for Roger and his whole family. During the announcements just a minute ago, I mentioned Lauren, but then we just immediately jumped to how that affected the rest of us. But let's now go back and pray for pray for Lauren. Uh, she has a lot uh, on her plate, a lot to, to worry about right now, and so uh, that God would heal her. Jim Barnes has had uh, quite a bit of pain uh, in the past few weeks, and tomorrow he will have uh, surgery to uh, hopefully take care of that. So pray for uh, Jim and Donna Barnes. Still, uh, Neil Kirkland and Fred Hudgens continue their treatments. Luhans, uh, once again in the, the waiting game stage, continue to pray for the Moffats. We've had uh, three three deaths in our church uh, just in the past week. Uh, Alana Munson went home to be with the Lord. Nedra's beloved Jerry, Jerry Murphy, and also uh, Glee Hykus. And uh, I'm out of words. Uh, also, uh, Sharon Rajak uh, took a fall. Uh, she uh, she's quite quite hurt. So pray for uh, Sharon as well. Hard to believe, but I could I could go on. But let's not. Uh, let's pray. Gracious God, what a wonderful uh, time of year it is, Lord, where we remember the good news that though the world is a dark place, you broke into it, and as one author said, you kicked the walls of darkness until it bled light. And so, Lord, we join men from the east and shepherds and throngs of angels heralding the bright light that is your son being born into this dark world and it indeed is a dark world first we must realize that the darkness is in us before we see it in others Lord, our hearts are bent inwards on ourselves. The devil is real. And all humans are stained with sin. And yet, Lord, that is only the starting point of the story of redemption. Lord, there is much good news to counter that bad news. The good news is that you did come, and you did come to bear our griefs, our sorrow, our sin, and our disease. And Lord, you were punished for our sin. You rose victorious over it. And so, Lord, you ascended. And Lord, all of us, through faith union, through faith connection in you, are seen to have done and accomplished everything that you accomplished because we're we're shielded by your priestly work. 
Lord, whatever is true of you becomes true of us. And so, Lord, we too will not be defeated by death because you have already taken care of sin. And when you took care of sin, you took care of its wages. So, Lord, our physical death is the last battle that we will ever have to battle. Lord, what great news that is that heaven, the new Jerusalem, the new creation is coming down. Lord, we thank you for that blessed hope. Yet, Lord, we're not, we're not there yet. We're, we're here. And so you call us to live by faith, to live with one eye toward the resurrection hope, but the other eye firmly planted in this world. And Lord, as we do, we have to live by faith because all our eyes see some days is sad things. And Lord, we need to be reshaped by your word. Have every thought of our heart brought into conformity with your word. Lord, we lift up all of those names I mentioned and the, the spouses, the kids and the grandkids that they represent, the friends that they represent, the caregivers. Lord, many are grieved uh, by, by these requests, Lord. And yet you are the great physician. You are the comforter. And Lord, you are sovereign. And so we can uh, request these things of you knowing that you know uh, better than we do. We know that you are uh, always doing the best thing. And so, Lord, uh, we pray for comfort and we pray for healing and we pray those things in confidence, knowing who it is that we pray to. Lord, we uh, bring our nation and its leaders before you. Lord, regardless of their faith or lack of, we believe in your common grace control over everything that happens. And so, Lord, we we ask that you would bless our leaders with an extra measure of wisdom and a sense of righteousness and justice and truth. Lord, uh, we do not ask for justice for us, for our nation, but we do ask for mercy and compassion. Lord, as you are long-suffering to this country, we still are afforded religious freedoms, and so, Lord, we praise you for that. Lord, we pray for our missionaries that we are able to continue to support them financially and prayerfully. We bring all of these requests to you in the words you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I don't know that these flowers are in honor of Al and Lois Hewitt's 50th anniversary, but I think there's about a 99% chance they are. That's why I didn't say anything. And then now I think saying the wrong thing is probably better than saying nothing at all. That should be a song. Um, uh, so Al and Lois Hewitt, they had a 50th wedding anniversary, whether those flowers represent that or not. Doesn't matter. They still had a 50th wedding anniversary. So praise be to God for that, for that union. And now, uh, let's hear from God's Word. Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, 
the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, there are a few uh, passages of Scripture more familiar to all people, but especially to Christians. As Pastor Mike said last Sunday, we have heard uh, some of these literally hundreds of times read and preached on. And yet, uh, your word, like your mercies, are new every morning. Why? Because the word of God is living and active and piercing and effective. And so, Lord, an old story is not really old because it has spoken to us afresh into the barrenness and darkness that we live in, the same as the original hearers who lived in a spiritual barrenness and a spiritual darkness. And so, Lord, we pray the things we know, things we've known for years, things that are really quite obvious, will not be boring or ho-hum or catch us sleeping, but rather, Lord, will be laid afresh on our hearts and minds and that we can somehow, by the Spirit, wonder again, be full of awe again at what the Christmas story means and that it would be truly the best news that we have heard in him. Amen. And so this uh, very familiar passage of Scripture, uh, of course, uh, gives us in the most uh, just the facts, ma'am type of way. It gives us the most almost ho-hum account of the birth of Jesus imaginable, the most understated uh, way possible uh, the birth of Jesus is announced. And it tells us uh, when and where and to who and how uh, Jesus was born. So first, when it took place in the days, it says, when a decree went out from Caesar Augustus and also when Quirinius was governor of Syria. So the story of Luke 2 does not start this way, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, or once upon a time. To sophisticated, educated, 21st century readers, Dr. Luke told us in chapter 1, I have, I have researched this. I have gone to all primary sources. I asked Elizabeth how it happened. I asked Mary how it happened. They told me these are, these are first-hand accounts, though I, Dr. Luke, am a historian. I am giving you first-hand accounts from the actual players. Remember, Luke traveled around on missionary journeys with the Apostle Paul. So he's, he's heard the history. He's heard how it all happened. He's had, he's had uh, 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 research done with, with all of the major players of the New Testament. And Luke says, this is not a heartwarming fairy tale full of warm principles. No, this is rooted in history. This happened when the grandnephew of Julius Caesar, when he was Caesar, this, this specific Caesar, Caesar Augustus, who ruled from 24 BC to uh, 27 BC to, to 1480. And so, so the birth of Jesus took place in that time frame. And it happened when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And if we, we, we give Matthew's account, we know that when it was when Herod was, was king of the Jews. And then that gives us a, a, a small window of time. And then Luke knows that that small window of time isn't specific enough history. And so he says it's, remember that time there was the census, the, the first census? It was during that time. And so think of how you would measure time if you didn't have a watch or a cell phone. You would measure time by who was president and, and during that presidency, who was, who was mayor at the time and when that mayor did something. And so when you did that, after two or three statements, you would have a pretty 
specific time frame in mind. And so this is important because Luke wants us to know that Jesus came and it's rooted in history. It's rooted in real historical fact. And this is important because evil, whenever it's dealt with through a through a war or through law enforcement or through legislation, guess what always happens to evil? It comes back. It 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 takes a it takes a brief respite and then it and then it comes back and it comes back with a with a different form or in a, a different dictator or in a or with a new technology that the evil never had before and now no no matter what happens uh, you can do your best on a human level but you can never eradicate evil completely you can never get at the root of it and so the message of Christmas told by Doctor Lucas. Jesus came at a historic time. He came in real time, in real space, to a real place that just that in one second. To get at the very root of human evil. To get at sin, which is the root cause of every malady we suffer. And so that's why it's so important to understand the when of when Jesus. That's why that's why Luke wastes a few verses. Uh, well, he doesn't waste them. That's why it looks to us like Luke wastes a few verses because he's got to root this in history and he doesn't just root this in time history. He roots this in place history. And he says that this happened in Bethlehem. It's important for a few reasons. It's important because it speaks to the how, which we'll get to in a second, the how of Jesus' birth. But the place is also important. And the reason the place is important is, as I I read when Jim was uh, lighting the Advent candle, it is a clear prophecy of Scripture that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And one of the main reasons we have confidence in the Christian faith, the confidence that the Scripture is true, is fulfilled prophecy. And I know how unpopular the next thing out of my mouth is to say in 2020 in Southern California, but here it is. The Book of Mormon has no fulfilled prophecy. The Quran has no fulfilled prophecy. The when and the where of all major world religions are pretty much irrelevant to the truthfulness of their religion. Christianity, however, hangs on historical claims of of when and where. And so Christians say, look, Jesus could not have engineered or or manufactured where he was born. Over 400 years before he was born, it said that the the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And then Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And the chances of being born in Bethlehem are really low. Because not a lot of people live in Bethlehem. And there he is, born in a humble place at a specific time. To who? To Joseph and Mary. They are, they're named for us. And what do we know about Joseph and Mary? Here's what we know. That they are law-abiding, law-keeping, observant Jews. And they went to the temple to offer a sacrifice. And we know that there was a sacrifice for the upper middle class. And if you couldn't afford that, there was a sacrifice for the middle class. And if you couldn't afford that, there was a sacrifice for the impoverished, for the poor. And that's the one, two turtle doves, just kidding, I tried to make a cultural connection there, two doves, two pigeons, And that was the sacrifice that Joseph and Mary offered. And so if you put that together with what Pastor Mike said last week, where he said, between 13 and 15, let's call it 14, you've got quite quite the thing going on here. You've got a 14-year-old 
pregnant young lady in poverty. That's who Jesus was born to. Not well-to-do people. So that, that's all important. The when and the where and to who Jesus was born were all important. But the how in verses 6 and 7 are what's really the key to this text, the understated key to this text. Mary went while pregnant, no doubt knew the prophecy of Micah, and she goes while pregnant, and we're not told how long, if it was the day after she got there, or a month after, we don't know. Mary with child has the child, and what happens? Verse 7. She gave birth to her firstborn son, which means she had others later, wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for him, for them, in the inn. There's no possible way I can say anything new to you about Christmas. So I just beg you once again, to just sit back and look at it, think about it. The God who spoke all things into existence, an almighty, sovereign God of history who had no beginning, who has no end, who is all-knowing, fully present everywhere, took on a human nature and became a germ, became a embryo, fully dependent on Mary's body, became a fetus, became tiny, became killable, became vulnerable. Think of the humility involved in that. And we don't think about God as humble. We think about Jesus, a, a humble rabbi who's, who's helping poor lepers. We think of Jesus as humble, but remember, Jesus is a perfect image, a perfect exemplar, a perfect picture. He is the true image of God. And so if we rightly see Jesus as humble, then we have to see God the Father's humility as well, even though that's something we never think about as God the Father being humble. And yet, think about it. Think about how many steps down the infinite rung that is. God came down, but he came down in such humility that I don't have the words for it. I tried to think of what that would be like. And I was even going to say something about you becoming an ant. Would you become an ant to save the ants? And then I realized I can't go with that. Because even then, it doesn't come close to the description of what happened at Christmas. God come down. He came away lower down than we becoming ants. He came down at Christmas. I thought about this theme in Scripture. Remember in Genesis 28, as Jacob is trekking through his wilderness journey, and he finds a big old stone for a pillow, and he has a dream, and he sees a ziggurat, we call a ladder, Jacob's ladder. And remember what it says? It says that angels were ascending. And as we looked at that years ago, what was the import of the angels ascending in that vision of Jacob? It's that God had already come down. The angel of the Lord had already come down. The angels were going up the stairs, not, not coming down the stairs. Why? Because they had already come down the stairs. The angel of the Lord was already with them, and the angels were ascending because God had already come down. And we see in the New Testament, John 1, I think it's the very last verse, probably 50 or 51 of John chapter 1, 
Jesus is calling his first disciples. And there is this outstanding young man, Nathaniel, and Jesus says, come, be my disciple. And Nathaniel, boom, he believes already. Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. And Nathaniel is this devout believer in Jesus just off that. And Jesus is surprised at Nathaniel's face. Faith, you believe because I said I saw you under the fig tree the other day? If you believe at that, at that little sign that was some significance to Nathaniel and Jesus, who knows, people think Nathaniel was probably praying for the revelation of the Messiah under the fig tree, and then when Jesus said that, it triggered that. We don't know what happened, but, but, but Jesus and Nathaniel knew what happened. And Jesus says to Nathaniel, if you're amazed at that little work I did, you're really going to be amazed because something's going to happen. Angels will ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. And when Jesus says that to Nathaniel, he is bringing to mind that story of Jacob saying this, that this is the how of Scripture. This is the how of your salvation. This is how God always works. He descends. It is not our ascent. It is his descent. Psalm 24, the call to worship. Who will ascend the hill of the Lord? The one with clean hands and a pure heart will ascend the hill of the Lord. What does the rest of Scripture tell us? No one has clean hands and a pure heart. God has to come down at Christmas. God has to come down always. He has to come down to Jacob. He has to come down and calling the disciples and saying, I am the staircase to heaven. I am the ladder to heaven. And he comes down to, to in a specific time, in a specific place, to people in poverty. God comes down and makes himself vulnerable in what? A manger, a feeding trough made of wood. Foreshadowing what? That the greatest humility was not a baby in a feeding trough of wood, but it's a foreshadowing, a preview, a nugget, a morsel, an appetizer to what the main course is going to be. He'll be nailed to wood. And in ignorant, medical ignorance, they wrap him in swaddling clothes. And we all picture that one blanket that every hospital in the world has. That one white blanket with the weird color pink and the weird color blue stripe. And we think, oh, swaddling clothes, how cozy. In fact, I'll, I'll have a manger scene and the cows will be smiling and everything will be perfectly backlit and I'll have this cozy scene and no. Jesus is wrapped in swaddling clothes. You know what swaddling clothes were? a symbol of that, that time period, a symbol of their ignorance. They believed that the, that the baby's limbs would grow uh, in a deformed or a, or a non-perfect way, and so they were this constrictive clothing, constricting the baby, not cozy, whatever, thread count, cotton, whatever, swaddling clothes, no, restrictive garments of ignorance, which foreshadowed what? Yes, that's humility for God to come down to that, but the only thing I can think more humiliating than that is a naked man hanging on a tree. And where, where were they? Joseph did not have the cachet. Joseph did not have the sway. Maybe not cachet, maybe cash. Joseph couldn't secure a room for his pregnant fiancé, bride. Joseph was such a non-influential person that he couldn't point at the belly of his wife and say, look, can we get a room here? 
He was that inconsequential of a person that there is no room for him in the end. And yes, is that humiliating? Yes. But you know what's even more humiliating than that? Not one innkeeper, but the entire crowd yelling, crucify him, crucify him. You see, being born in a manger is humiliating, but being pinned to a cross is the ultimate humiliation. Being wrapped in swaddling clothes is humiliating and ignorant, but nothing is more humiliating and human ignorant than crucifying Jesus naked, shamed, and exposed. And nothing is more rejected than an innkeeper saying, I'm not even giving a pregnant lady a room, than a whole crowd full of people people yelling, crucify him. You see, this is the pattern. God comes down. We don't ascend to heaven because we can't. God comes down. And I've used this illustration before, but it's the only one I can think of. Please give me grace. But as a child, one of the the most fascinating things my idiot brain could ever do was to go to the mall or to the Macy's and to see that down escalator, and I would just sprint at that down escalator, and I would try to get up, and all the time the stairs are moving down, and it was faster than my stupid boy legs could, could traverse. I don't like to brag, but I've spent hundreds of hours at parks the last eight years. And you know what every two- or three-year-old kid everywhere wants to do? Every kid's brain works. The, I've not seen one exception, I don't think. Two, three, four years old. They go down the slide. And then their little kid brain thinks this. Well, I just went down the slide. I'll flip over like an otter in Northern California on a rock. I'll, I'll flip over all awkwardly. I'll flop over like this. Get on my knees and my elbows. And then I'll just go back up the way I came down. And almost every two, three, four-year-old, it's too slippery. There's other kids banging them off the... And it's a hopeless endeavor for a two-year-old to get back up that slide. It's a hopeless endeavor. Now, of course, the athletic 10-year-old me, I could make it up that down escalator. But spiritually speaking, we're all the six-year-old me. We're trying to ascend. We're trying to show God all the good things we've done. But it's no use. God has to come down. We cannot ascend. Salvation is always in humble circumstances. This is always how it works. It's never how we think. Now, this is going to be really hard for you all to do but I want you to try anyway. Picture living under government authority that you don't agree with. Picture living under government authority that you even suspect one or two of them might have it out for people who share the same faith as you. Now picture living in a dusty, off-the-beaten-path kind of place. Can you picture those things? Can you picture living in an insignificant town under Antichrist authority somewhere? Can you picture that? This is going to be the hardest for you. Now picture not being wealthy, of needing money. This is the situation that Mary and Joseph found themselves in. Who is the baddest guy on the entire planet? It's Caesar Augustus. Who is the supreme local authority? The governor, Quirinius. And yet what is Luke nodding to? The sheer irony of this birth, the sheer upside downness, the sheer backwardness of this birth, which is what? 
God had prophesied the Messiah who would be born in Bethlehem. And therefore, Caesar Augustus is using his free will to invent this survey, this census. And Quirinius is doing, using his own free will to enforce this census and this survey. But guess what? In the mysterious, beautiful economy of God, what is happening? The most powerful man in the world thinks that he's freely choosing this, and he is freely choosing it. And Quirinius, the, the local pawn, is doing the same. And yet what? All of their evil, all of their power, all of their pomp, all of their Roman pride, it's being used by God in the most humble, out-of-the-place way to do the greatest thing that this world has ever seen. And so here's the point. This is why it's important that the how, that God comes down to us in humble circumstances, is because we want to believe that unless we have the right people in political office, God is going to have a hard time working through this. If we don't live in the influential city where our voice can be heard, that God's going to have a hard time with this. That if we just had more money, then we would have more sway and more say, and we wouldn't be like Joseph who can't even get a room for his pregnant fiance. We think that God is going to be stymied by these things. And yet God is always working in humble, surprising ways. I mean, just look a few minutes ago. Do you remember praying for Beth a couple of years ago? Do you remember Beth's health a couple of years ago? And I bet if we would have huddled up with the Tonning family and talked about it, I bet nobody could have said, oh, I, I know God is going to, I know exactly what God is up to right now. Though Beth's, Beth's health is poor, God is doing this wonderful thing through her poor health. And on the couple steps away, six feet away, sits Jim Wells. And I bet the Sunday we came up and told you that, that Jim had been in a terrible accident. His, his car was shorn in two, a foot behind where his body was. We don't see any good in any of these things that happen. And as we see people bury their spouses and we see people diagnosed with COVID and with cancer and broken hips and people relocating. What do our minds and our hearts say? I don't see anything God could be doing from this. Be transported magically next to Moses. Rock hard place, Red Sea, greatest military might in the world. I don't like any of those four options. And guess what you would say to Moses? Boy, I don't see anything good God could be doing right now. Then be transported magically. You wrap those ropes around Isaac. You put kindling under Isaac. You see Abraham's blade sharp glinting in the sun. And you stand next to Abraham and you say, I don't see any good God could be doing right now. You stand next to Mary and you see her firstborn son nailed to a cross. And at that moment, you would turn and say to Mary, there is no way in the world that this is winning. There is no way that this is salvation. There's no way that this is victory. Through my eyes, all I see is defeat. And yet, what looked like certain defeat to human eyes was spiritually the moment of greatest victory. And so, when are we going to get the point? 
that God is always working through humble people in far out places who are outnumbered. The politicians are... When are we going to realize that the way up is actually down? That Jesus came in humility to serve. And that is what exalted him. And when are we going to realize that just when everything looks its most sad, its bleakest, its darkest. Now, I'm not a masochist. I'm not saying the death of loved ones, cancer, broken hips. I'm not saying those things are good. But when are we going to see in the midst of those hard, difficult things that that is very often when God is working salvation. That is the message of Christmas. You see, remember a few weeks ago I preached on the birth announcement to Elizabeth and last week Mike preached on the birth announcement to Mary? You know when we think back to those old and young lady, we think, well, of course I would believe because An angel came and it was a supernatural event and spoke to these ladies and they had this experience. And remember last week, Pastor Mike's passage? Oh, blessed one, the angel said to Mary. And yet after that angelic visit where she's called most most blessed one, look at what her circumstances bore out. Having a baby in a stall. You see, she still had, Elizabeth, they still had to live by faith. Even after the angel came and gave God's sure word of promise. Even they, they still had to walk by faith. Their life still didn't seem to match up with the things God had said. God had called her blessed, but I'm going to go ahead and bet that having a baby and placing him in a manger sure didn't seem like she was being blessed. And so let's all take heart and take courage, but most importantly, live by faith. There's always going to be a Caesar Augustus. Apple Valley, well, We did make national news this week. But anyway, Apple Valley will probably never be a major player on the world stage. You might ascend to a higher socioeconomic status than Joseph, but probably not life-changing money type status. There's humility. There's brokenness. There's not a lot of redemption that you can see, but by faith, that is usually when God is at work the very most. Gracious God, let us learn to live by faith, to not look at circumstances, but rather at the God behind our circumstances, to be as little children who do not look at the scary streets they're walking on, but instead look up at their father who is holding their hand through those streets. Lord, let us live through the eyes of faith, and not the eyes of our own logic and reasoning and the eyes of the news, human wisdom. Lord, we thank you that you had the humility to come and leave all the wealth of all the nations behind and become poor and vulnerable so that we might become rich in you. Amen. Let's stand together and uh, there printed in your bulletin is Angels We Have Heard on High.
now may the God of all hope fill you with joy as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Spirit. Amen.